everybody for coming. Um, some of you don't know who I am. So I'm Gillian Vicky. At one point I was Gillian Workman. And I came out as Gillian Workman to Hong Kong in 1970 from the UK after teaching at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. And I came out to join the English department at this university. After an interlude of three years, when I was teaching at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, I returned to Hong Kong and retired some time ago as associate professor in the Department of English at Hong Kong Baptist University. I then became very busy with a research project and also as co-publisher with my husband, Werner Bickley, who sends good wishes to everybody for a happy evening. A co-publisher of Provis Hong Kong. We publish fiction, non-fiction, and poetry. Oh, I can take this off. I told everybody they could take it off. So I guess I, I, guess I, can, I, guess I can do so too. Um, we publish fiction, non-fiction, and poetry with some academic sports and other titles. My own writing has two main streams, poetry and topics within the 19th century history of Hong Kong. I'll be speaking on both of these at the Hong Kong Book Fair on Saturday. You're very welcome to register to attend from 3 to 4.30 p.m. And Felix, who's here tonight, will be there on Saturday as well, so there'll be two familiar faces. We're most grateful to the University of Hong Kong Libraries for organizing and hosting this evening. Our gratitude goes in particular to Mr. Peter Sidorko, until very recently, University of Hong Kong librarian, to Mr. Gary Chin, Public Relations and Development Manager, and Ms. Karis Lai, Public Relations and Development Library Assistant. I'm very pleased that Karis is here tonight and we're going to rely on her if we have any technical problems. She's very competent and helpful, so we're very lucky that Karis is here. Before I invite this evening's readers to come forward, I want to mention the display of books at the back of the room. These are books published by Promus Hong Kong as successful entries for the International Promus Prize for unpublished fiction, non-fiction or poetry which Werner and I founded in 2008. 17 entries so far have been published as winners of the prize, which may be shared by at most two, two entries. I was going to say two people, but two entries. 32 have been awarded publication prizes, and two additional entries have also been published. The majority of these books, which we've donated to the library for exhibition, are on the table at the back for you to see. In turn, the library now offers them as gifts to you. If you wish to take one, you're invited to do so. If you'd like to give a donation to the Hong Kong U Libraries in return, please drop in the big box marked for donations with a, a, a suggested donation of $20, but you don't have to donate anything. In March 2016, five of the winning writers in the Provis Prize competition over the years up to that date had the valuable opportunity of introducing their books at this University of Hong Kong Libraries Reading Club. And you can see the video of that event on YouTube from the Library Reading Club webpage. In 2016, Werner and I founded a second prize, the International Provis Poetry Prize for Single Poems. Successful entries appear in an annual anthology, Mingled Voices, the subject of this evening's event. And now it's the turn of some of these poets to share their work with you and with each other. We'll begin with live readings, I hope that live readings, from the poets who are present, uh, presented in alphabetical order of surname. Then comes the turn of overseas poets who have sent in video recordings of their own readings. The reading order 
in their case, will follow a different logic. We leave time for question and answer session when you may ask the poets present, each other, to tell you something about their poem or about their experience of writing poetry. This may mean that we can't hear all the recorded videos, but to make sure that you can hear them, we've uploaded all of them to YouTube. We'll give you the link later. And please take the time to view them at home if we don't manage to get round to them. Or even if we do, you may want to listen to them again. Now, to the poets who are present, I've asked the poets to come forward and read their poem with no introduction. We think we'll all enjoy the exercise of working out our own understanding of what we hear. A brief bio of each poet is given in the slides we'll show, hopefully smoothly, I'm, I, I have to do that, together with their poem title, the book where you'll find the poem, and the page number. And the first poet, because her surname begins with B-A, <laughs> is Chica Vance. She can't answer. Never alone. Never alone, never lonely, never forsaken. A string of friends forever on display. Never short of parties or invitations. The eternal grasshopper lost in a stack of hay. A press of people, jingle, laughter, surrounded day after day after day, until thoughts are flotsam mere echoes thereafter, keeping imagination and intuition at bay. Every hour, every minute spoken for. An empty day is a loser's blind. How do we measure ourselves up now, if not through the steady stream of lights? Riding the waves of virtual voices, drowning in the cacophony of comments, the mind flees from reason's house blurs the line between reality and pretense. Solitude, the cuss word of the new age, is like the haunting night to be feared, an endless void that engulfs, degrades, erasing you until you've disappeared. But while you rush by, you were too quick, shunning the pleasures of the solitary. You forget the sound of your own pulse tick succumb to the crowds, play to the gallery. The constant striving leaves you spent. You sink deeper with every splash, like a dead weight to the ocean's end. The self grows dim. It turns to ash. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Liam Blackford. This poem is called A Steel Vertical Pole. A steel vertical pole vaults from a sea of clouds up through the atmosphere. You are climbing the pole and have been for some time. Let go and you will fall. Strong winds buffet the pole sending strong vibrations echoing down its length. At times, it rocks so hard that you must stop climbing and hold fast for safety. Recently, your grip failed and you dropped 90 feet before catching a hold and falling no further. You paused to steal your heart then resumed your climbing. The pole changes with time. 
Once it became a square, edged by four sharp corners, unfriendly to the hands and making the ascent much harder and slower. Later, the pole widened, thicker than a tree trunk. Your arms, hugged around it, could not touch each other. Slow as ice, you crawled up, face pressed against the steel. Looking towards the sky, the pole goes forever. Its end cannot be seen. You can stop for a while, smell the wind, rain and steel, but you must keep climbing. Thank you. translated by my old friend, former David Hart, professor of Chinese at Oxford. And so it, in this occasion, I hope that I can read my poem uh, in original, and then the translation in honor of Professor Hawks, who's a great translator, the translator of Penguin Edition, the story of the stone. The Chinese poem, Ding Hai Nian He Sui. If you don't read Chinese, don't understand Chinese, just hear my voice then. Nian Ji, Sui Te Han Feng, Zhu Jian Piao Yao La. Sui Yung Mu De, Huan Le Qi Feng, Chan Zhe Qi Feng Chou Chang. Shijian, 与流水无别自由自在不要心起急看远方，没错，是一片云，潇洒如鹰，展开了双翅。Professor Hawk's translation uh, is very interesting because my poem has four literary allusions to Chinese classics, and for him, it's easy. It's no problem for him to translate them. But perhaps uh, you'll find uh, some names are uh, uh, unfamiliar. But to him, it's just like Shakespeare, Goethe, and other Chinese uh, classics. The intimations of aging, following the cold wind's wake, 
the intimations of aging. Tinge with years, years and joys with a limp hint of melancholy. Time, that deep river, glides unperceptibly on, bearing off passions and partings, bringing limitless expectations. Hope is the hawser that holds our lives boat in the current as we wait and wait for a wind to blow from we don't know where. Then, hoisting our sail, we can sail off to distant waters, wandering like the great pung bird released from every care. Rising up early, I read aloud poems of Dongpo, then Tai Chi exercises. For this morning, I feel energetic, glimping gray hairs as I'm dressing in front of the mirror. Does the frosting, I wonder, now cause me to look more distinguished? Outside the window, the birds, Mosasian wobblings, and the blue distant hills, charming as Jia Xuan's verses. Is it poem or painting, time's passing show? It is Li Niang, lower humming, the garden's multifloret splendor. Kinan at close of year, cold wind blows in the bare branches, fluttering the few dead leaves that cling to the dream of summer. It has dropped now, and unmistakably in the distance, a cloud like a huge bird floats with its wings outspread. Thank you. Refuge, a place of safety from the drizzled frazzle, the conceits of our eye fearing loss of home, family, friend for all our days. To be found hazy through worry, the marathon ahead, the gargoyle on your shoulder whispering strange nothings life flaying, you are stranger. Where to find refuge in the beaches of childhood? Wave watching and finding God in the seahorses? The sea is now stranger. In the swell lies malevolence. Where lies refuge? Security in a smile a place to lie down and stretch and wake. Your world not rocked, your family there, free to stay or wander at will. There lies refuge, riding the seahorses who will gently lay you down.
particles on her bed. Beyond the wrinkles on your skin, old love, first love, new love, impossible love, imagined white dove, lies my eternal fall. Beyond your pale, ghostly figure, merciless eyes and cruel goodbyes, lies you and my unappeasable ghosts. The ghosts of moments I missed, of words I never said and lips I never kissed, of abandoned streets I still walk, of statements that put an end to talk, of intimate close spaces I never saw, of turbulent life stages I never lived, of a carcass that kept me forever obsessed, beyond the wrinkles on your skin, ancient cup mandate from above, inevitable course of legend and law, lies my eye to me, lies my eye beyond me, making love, unbelievable love, to my unappeasable ghosts. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Armin. Sandana Hamilton is moving house. He apologizes. He can't come. Sadie. It's Sadie. Unexpectedly, it's your turn now. <laughs> but Sadie came. Sadie. writing a poem, so I do apologize for you in that here. War of Voices. Once upon a time, our minds were defined. Our lives were in real time, not filtered online. The hunger to be heard creates a war of voices. It controls our minds and dictates our choices. The weapons involved are the weapons of words. The stories we color with nouns and with verbs. The voices we hear are loud, certain and clear. They're decisive, divisive, and driven by fear. They do what they can to attack our humanity. They know we don't often think that rationally. The human condition, a war of attrition, <laughs> driven by recognition, ridden by mission. Outsiders peering in, voyeurism burgeoning, we crave a distraction, a battle call for action. Propaganda determines who wins and who dies. We're tricked into believing it's dangerous lies. We think up shortcuts to process our lives. We jump to conclusions and we generalize. We rely on the certainty of being right. Contradicting data we delete out of sight. Bias affects us like feelings do. It misdirects us from experience, too. No wonder we're drawn to unsolvable mystery. We're all mental slaves on the wrong side of history. Polarized and polarized, we bleed our red lines. An innocent pastime to be the daily grind. And that is about a third of the way through the poem. It goes on forever. Sorry. Yeah. Susan Lavender is going to stand on a book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Stand on this book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my name is Susan Lavender, and the name of my poem, the name of my poem is The Dying Bride. Once again, oh, sorry, I'm supposed to take a mask off. <laughs> sorry about that all starts. <laughs> okay. Once again, she stands ready to meet her groom. Ever less steady, she awaits her inevitable doom. She recalls many moons ago the first time. No father to defend her. She yielded to his salty slime. A child bride, buoyed by enthusiasm, virgin, pristine, 
ravishing, not ravished, shiny and clean. This year, as each year on Ascension Day, they renew their vows, stooping ever more arthritically to her Lord and Master, she bounds, as a wedding ring drops in water to the crowd's applauding roar. It's just one more briny notch on his ancient score. Against his now aging, yet ever elegant whore, She's no longer a maid, she's simply decayed. She's ravaged and raped, she's battered and bruised. But as he devours her, seasoned with salt, he's quietly amused. Giant cement hands prop up her osteoporotic plight, but they can't withstand her gradual crumbling, sinking out of sight. He says, Surrender to me. Can't you see? I won't let you stand taller than me. He persists. Faithful as always, she can't resist. She says, I choose not liberty, but thee. She has no choice. She has no voice. He doesn't want her above him. He's dragging her down slowly into his lagoon. He wants her beneath him to be submerged very soon. Venice, bride of the sea, abused wife of the sea, soon to be a drowned bride city under the sea. Susan wasn't reading at all. She knew it all no, by heart. I, I, I tried to hold that one. <laughs> you, you did very well. Jan. Drink hand, Janice. Basket, you escaped hunger, brought into a house of wars, fields, dramas, and a husband deprived of love and literacy. The tattoo carved into your wrist became the only word you recognize, the only window to the outside world that you fear, dread, yet eager to embrace. One day, one day, only one day. But the shelter gradually built up, collapsed, eventually. Tree, rope, life taken. Tears, bombs, fears tighten. Four new lives, four after four. Home became the second tattoo, this time carved into your heart. You fell in love, being loved, only to be embraced by darkness again. Rope, door, black moon, anguish, pen, broken noon. You picked up life, embraced the love, the two tattoos, family found tranquility in the river of time, integrated into one named destiny. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So, Raji, it's your turn. Hello everyone, um, Raji, 
and be reading my poem, Fresh Start. Seasons change, times change, bidding adieu, welcoming the new, looking for pristine possibilities, wheeling it over. The gentle breezes ease out a very soothing pharaoh as the leaves gently glide down from the thick treetops. Bright colored seeds and leaves warm up dormant dreams and deck up the dawning hopes deep, deep within. Revisiting the dream links, coloring the long lost thoughts, wishing for a time freeze of ever loud moments. Life is all about walking past with good old times, racing forward with aspirations, hoping for prayers to be answered. Thank you very much, So, Jose Semina is going to read a different poem. He's going to read My City. Hello, good evening. I'm uh, Jose, and I want to say that I was born in a city that was dead and came back to life. And I happened to be in Berlin when the wall was open. So I believe in miracles. And this poem is called My City. I live in a city of those from before from when cities were invaded. Although we don't have walls, maybe because here the tourists are not for stones, nor to climb towers if there are no escalators. City of endless people, like flocks of birds going up and down, carrying something in the beak, dressed in different colors, like countries in a map. How different everything when you cross a border and colors are gone. I also go up and down with something in my beak, with blank words and leaden words. When my mood is not charitable, I take the bus and stand up in the exit, as if instead of going to the office, I was going to destroy the Tower of Babel. But most of the time, I normally take the tram because it's made of wood and iron and because through the window I see myself on the sidewalk of, on top of a horse saying goodbye over and over to Miss Clementine who decided to stay and wants to be a teacher. In Afghanistan or Nigeria they could kill her for that. But this city is from before. And a man can still have a dream and leave galloping. This city is so much from before that it has no color in the maps. We don't have walls, but we are left on our own. I look up at the sky and the storks go past. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose. Louisa Tena. Louisa. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Luisa Ternau, and I'm going to read my poem for So Sweet is the Sound of My Youth. With an icy look, she dismissed me, stating, most people are in need of society. Only a few by society are needed. I was poor, too, but I understood the formula and worked my way to be needed greatly. Cover your wound, she yelled. It, it moves no one to pity. Cover your wound, she yelled. You obviously made it yourself. It moves no one to pity. 
Thus, in my youth, I was harangued by a passing courtesan while begging by the main gate for me and my siblings. Now I wander from castle to city, from city to castle. I play my lute in beautiful halls where rich tapestries hang from the wall, mostly obtained by the killing of many people that in life may have been needed or not. Certainly, their lot was to die in a battle not fully understood and be swallowed into rapid forgetfulness. I do not sport a self-inflicted wound now. I do not need to elicit pity to get more coins. But in my sojourning abroad, everyone runs to hear my loot. Thus, I lost the shack I called home when my siblings were waiting for me. In the notes of my loot, I can only but dream of it. Just the hope to play in heaven after all these wanderings make me, make me go, makes me go from castle to city, from city to castle and beyond. Along the path, I may stop and play my lute to the trees while I watch the sound reaching for the sun. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louisa. Louisa is actually the last live reader because Bibiana apologizes greatly. She's suddenly going to dinner. She has to, a business dinner she has to go to in Chim Sa Choi starting at six. So there was no way whatsoever that she could do both things this evening. So she apologizes to everybody. So thank you very much to all poets present this evening. Thank you very much. We're now going to look at recorded readings from around the world. I think in that order. If we don't, as I said before, if we don't have time to hear all of them, please listen to them at home. I'll give you, there's a strip of paper there with the link to the YouTube. Okay, playlist. Because I see carrots coming in, in case I need help, which I may. Yes, so that's the, so that's the YouTube link. That's the channel link. But, but there's a specific link to the playlist as well. I do have a slip of paper on the table over there. You can pick it up later. An extremely long playlist title. <laughs> I have I have made I have made it live already, but at the time I did this it wasn't live, so I just had to give you the whole title. So now let's let's listen, if I can manage it with Karis's help to the readings. Hello everyone. I am Maria Elena Blanco. I was born in Cuba but I am greeting you all from Chile on the Southern Hemisphere, where I spent half the year, the other half being spent in Vienna, Austria. I would now like to read for you my poem, Waiting for Ulysses, which is on page 42 of the Mingled Voices for Anthology. Waiting for Ulysses. Waiting for Ulysses is the title of a poem a mode of pretending, a manner of discourse, not a matter of fact. It is a wink at Beckett, a bow to Gaddafi, a laugh with Joyce, hardly a real laugh. We know how it all reads. No exit, lost illusions, dangerous relations. It is all but literature and it is all literature. Whereby we're done with waiting for, waiting out, waiting on, waiting by, and just plain waiting. Waiting for Ulysses, I am not waiting for Ulysses. He is coming to me 
and no other gods are there to save him. He has some business pending here at Siren's Reef, having to do with cleansing his bad name, his bad habits, his bad breath, his bad karma. Sly of mind he is, haughty his tone, a tinge of red still on his hands. He better heed the call, thinks he reluctantly, lest he once more awaken the wrath of Zeus. Slightly distraught now, he hears voices. I am Circe, bent, stark naked, on catching the ideal husband. I bring you fantasies. Mad and drunk, you revel in my sultry night games. I am Nausicaa, secretly dreaming of the ideal husband. Chaste, I give you just a glance of me. You are enticed, but move on and bask in your own pleasure. I am Calypso, offering bed and board to the ideal husband. I charm you with my songs. You buy our wedded bliss. Later, get bored, long for Penelope. I am Penelope, waiting for the return of my ideal husband. I keep our vows, surrounded by my lovers. Distrustful, you come back in disguise. I am Athena. I say stop and beware. A new Iliad has started. Paris was abducted by Helen. You are expected here at Siren's Reef at my behest. I'll give you 20 minutes to review the deeds of the last 20 years, to repent for 20 plus centuries of your disastrous mankind, to reset your genes and reprogram your values and your valuables, to reprocess your words and speak to me eye to eye in the language of poetry. Hello everybody, my name is uh, J.P. Lindstroth and I was invited by uh, Jillian Bickley and Vern Bickley to read my poem, Boarding Up My Heart, uh, for the anthology Being With Voices. Um, I'm also the co-winner of the 2019 Proverse Prize. So thank you to them. This poem is a dedication to Native Americans and victims of the boarding school system. Boarding up my heart. I remember seeing Mama. She told me to be brave. My little sister and I left with them, thunder in the air. She said it would be OK as tears strained. I never understood why, her long flowing raven hair. She was my mama, quiet, humble, never drama. They cut our hair, they made us wear uniforms. They might have speak the English, no Ojibwe, none. They might have say, yes sir, yes ma'am. I could not speak, only stare. I tried to hide my sister. We hid in a closet upstairs. We whisper to each other in our tongue, I would not speak to the whites. They would beat us. I remember Mr. No, Mr. No, Mr. No, Mr. I refused to speak, I was silent. There was no words, there were no words, thunder in the air. There was a crow cawing on a leafless tree, and I stared at it through the window all the school day. A black, black crow as the steps moved up the stairs in a long creak, creak, creak. I wrote letters home, no answers alone. Letters home, no answers alone. My mama promised she would write. 
alone, my thoughts racing as on a velodrome. My relationship with Obama never the same. Now no government to blame. Priests and nuns in their private secret wicked ways. Kidnapped for a better life, eliminating our roaming around the lakes and along the plains. Like domesticated wild game, now completely tame. I was taken, my sister was taken. Kill the Indian, save the man. Save my sister and her doll. It's sewn on lips, it's button eyes. My own fortitude unshaken. I taken, my sister taken. Forsaken forever and forsaken. Home is actually based on an account of the peace activist and American Indian movement activist, Dennis Banks. And uh, he's a, uh, he was Ojibwe. His Ojibwe name was Noah Komik. He passed away in 2017. Thank you very much for listening to Boarding Up My Heart. Hi everyone, this is Aiden, Aiden Young, and I'm living in Shanghai, and I'm a Chinese poet writing both in Chinese and English. And my poem is called Stranger on the Street, on page 82 of the Mingo Forces Anthology. So here it is. A stranger on the street. He has been here since the time the city started to change by itself, feeling a hasty goodbye to its dubious past. Some people still believe the idea of a home. Ten years maybe, or even longer, man has to model and be amnesia the new norm in this country, so contentious like propaganda. We tend to forget about people under the wheel of a quickly moving forward history. I know him as the underbridge man who built his home under an overpass that turned silently like a broken flute above the city's monotonous thing. Maybe he could find peace there, a scroll of dirty sheets, a bag with a few winter coats, how he suffers the scorching summer, and a bowl to collect money with. He lives like a monk on offerings, but we, who are notoriously less trusting of the poor, do not really see him as he falls deeper and deeper into the shadow of the wall. We don't see many like him, especially inside the inner highway that surrounds the downtown like a polluted moat, saving out the unworthy who migrate every day like birds for those wheat fields. While crumbs do they gather, while innocent money falls from the gracious hands of the rich, I can't tell. There must be another way of living, a harsh way that will bend most of us like a twig in winter, then snap us away to make room for the next generation of more practical men. He's there, under the overpass, hands stretching out like one thin booty such a man is afraid to look at. Sometimes by bar and bee, sometimes half a pack of cigarettes, sometimes children spit in his path. I sit comfortably in the cafe, stories of a thousand different lives might spill from my pen. But none about him. For literature pales at the thought of human suffering, no words can sufficiently describe the force that sits upon the bed. I might be him one day, and he would sit inside this cafe, contemplating, affectedly, life's silent mockery. I have to give a proper ending to my writing, and to his reality as well, one that suits the current social climate. The weaponized kitchens of the analytics 
how this happens many times. I see the day when the God comes and whips him away like Rosen, his heart really cries. Short of a flawless argument that says, I, like most of my fellow brothers, only stand and watch. inspired by my bird feeder. I am a god to the birds. I am a god to the birds flocking to my feeder in winter, a forgiving god who, when winter winds bite and summer's bounty is frozen, miraculously provides fishes and loaves, sunflower seeds, and suet in exchange for their beauty, their bickering, their blessing. They cannot know how I praise them through the glass, astounded that they can fly and I cannot. That for them fear is so ordinary, so transcendent, that they proclaim the glory. When the winter of my soul chills, 
when the fruits of summer are exhausted, I turn to holy books to peck at their words for seeds of truth, for sustenance, for exaltation. I revel in the mystery, the prayer that a God behind the window loves me enough to feed my soul. Mr. Jack Mayer in Vermont, USA. He was the winner of the Poetry Prize one year. Hello to everyone. I am Carol Flake Chapman uh, in Austin, Texas, and I am reading this to you from the Hill Country in Central Texas. This is called Under the Blue Tarps. You could probably see them from space, the tarps that cover the broken rooftops, some from bombs, some from wind and fire, the patchworks of blue that pinpoint disaster. I've seen them filling in the blanks of the burnt orange tiles of Dubrovnik just after the siege when the mortars left craters on the shining marble streets. They were everywhere in New Orleans, covering the holes where some escaped from attics, using axes and butcher knives as the waters rose and it was life or death. In the town of Paradise, they blanketed the smoking ruins of dreams and lives lost or interrupted and what was left of the promise of always good weather. After fire, hurricane, tornado, or flood, they arrive as shelter from the storm, suggesting that camping isn't so bad and that the sound of rain on plastic is pleasing. If not angered, the ends of the tarp flap madly like manta rays finding themselves on the beach. These inorganic, unlovely stand-ins for real cover supposedly temporary, but often there till they rot. I imagine that someday we will all know that fake blue above our heads that flaps and fades in the sun as we lose the sense of safety we thought we held as the waters kept rising and the winds kept blowing. From Karen Blake Chapman, Austin, Texas. Hello everyone, I'm JD, living in Jakarta, and I'm the region director. This poem is called In the Ways of Midnight. In the Ways of Midnight. I have witnessed my people migrating through salt and water. They hurled their sacks of clothes from the boat to the shore, from wood to embers, and from ashes to homes. Mothers have cast lives in their pockets. I have listened to grandma's bedtime stories, praying to the regulatory list. Their wants were surpassed her, who ran away to become a farmer. He planted cucumbers, lettuce, and Dutch biscuits. I have passed down the family logos to my younger cousins, to my many nephews and nieces. Here, our ancestors hauled out their last chips as they baked their dough under the sun. My feather has grown in their adolescence, the burden of flame into the silent garden. I have kissed the earth out of loneliness. Their smell and moonlight taste the same. I have fallen in love with a stranger on the mountain, knowing I will never see her again. I have known the lands of time and place. Here, I have baptized myself shirtless in the waves of midnight. As the water fills my mouth, I can see the ashes rising again. Thank He's studying the USA at the moment. Hello everyone. Greetings from Adelaide in South Australia. My name is George Watt. I'm here to read one of the poems selected for Mingled Voices Father. The poem is titled The Black Birds of Cooper Place. Now, this is an intensely personal poem for me because I wrote it after my mother passed away. One of the things that she enjoyed doing more than anything was in the early morning or the evening to sit outside and listen to the blackbirds 
sin. The banquets of Cooper Place. Doesn't she look beautiful? No, she's yellow, grey, skeletal, a corpse, dead, just dead. Run, run from rest and peace, at her. The blackbirds too look lost. Who will sweep up the mess left on the long path to the road? The price of worms, the price of sorrow. Twice a day, she'd sweep it back to the beds, but they'd wait in the jacaranda tree or the ancient pepper tree till she turned her back and they'd drop and scatter again. On still, warm nights, we'd sit on the deck, hoping the mosquitoes would stay away. And sure enough, the plaintive song would come, notes hanging in the calm evening air. If you could grab them, hold them, we would. Instead, we try to find her location, pin her down, and just as we should think she's there or there, her notes rise from another place. The song is never quite the same. Shadows alter, a cricket might chirrup, or my chair creak and try not to make a human sound. Now, when the blackbirds sing at Cooper Place, you will not be there listening. But I can't escape the notion that you are there inside their song part of their love of evening and joy in the spring. Oh, I don't know if I have them, but I do know this. We three are infinitesimal notes that join a great chorus, the music of the spheres and its baffling harmony, no beginning, no end. But for now, Koga, I'll go and sweep the path. Hello everyone, I'm Thea Bishop, living in Brisbane, Australia, although I was born in the Netherlands and grew up there coming out to Australia in 1953 with my siblings and my parents. English is therefore not my first language. Um, my school age memories are therefore in Dutch. Um, my school age songs and favourite poems are in Dutch. But my children and grandchildren are thoroughly Australian. The poem I'm about to read to you arose out of the hymn composed by Martin Luther when he broke away from the Latin Mass. It's called the Reformation Hymn and because it reminds me so much of my mother, I decided to write this Reformation poem about her primarily and my memories of um, those school days. So I'll read to you the Reformation Okay, although the title I've given it is just Reformation. A mighty fortress in her chair, my mother sits, exists. Within her room, her square, she chats about her skin, her hair, the home she missed when this became her unit. Her unitary state approved, though she's the keystone of our art, could never be extracted. She's removed the solitary matriarch. The strength comes from within. Her base, our family tree of old, possession still of her antiques, kind face, a stubborn faith, foreign Dutch place, made up some chairs, bed in papers with mould, piled up where they might fit. Things not for use, or not for her. A stack of memories, an image, a way things never were, while she was still that personage. Her children's kids provide a cause of satisfaction or disdain. Their gifts are like a cookie, 
the silent force when they don't come, the source of pleasure or pleasure or deep pain. That is this she won't admit. The photos serve as proof complete that once she was, had once a life, a house, real bricks and mortar in a street, was once a valued wife. As chaff before the breeze she's blown, away from usefulness and roots. Her house pulled down, the children grown, walled off from life, she sits alone. Her memories, her servants, idly puts another bouquet near the bedside phone. Between the present and those gone, she flits. A mighty fortress once, now just a ruin. The ancient landscape of her life befits the castle of a queen opposed too soon. in Brisbane. She came to one of the famous receptions. Some of you may remember her. She came with her husband. She has a wonderful long white beard. Um, Neil Douglas is a, is a GP in London. This is quite a contemporary poem. Hello, my name is Neil Douglas from London, UK. And I'm going to read The Doctor is a Ship's Pilot, which is on page 80 of Mingled Voices 5. The Doctor is a Ship's Pilot. There is a simple dignity, a natural beauty in the tidal system of her consultation. The ebb and flow of patience, the first the last breath, all the heartbeats in between, their flotsam and jetsam, salt of tears, of fears submerged, surfaced, flotation of symptoms, navigation of complaints, to harbour a diagnosis, in prognosis, certainty of uncertainty, and the patience. Did I mention the patience? cry of gulls, silence of fish, their sense and nonsense, the untreatable, the unrepeatable swell smile of the sun, tug of the moon, we are married to them in health and in sickness, as the ripple breeze billows unfolding folded generations, in full sail passing out passing on in sympathy to the life and poetic, the compass of kindness in the span of a surgery, listening, not hearing, seeing, not watching the stars in their constellations by which we plot their course in the span of a hand, in the pulp of fingers, a lightness, firmness of touch, our turn at the wheel, of being here, of being there, for them, for us. So we've heard all the overseas poets, that's wonderful. I'm just now going to show you a co comment made by Maria Elena Blanco, the, the poet who read first. She very kind, she, she won the Provo's Poetry Prize one year. And then the following year, we invite that person to write a message for the new anthology. And this is part of the message that she wrote. Poetry is a special state. I like to think that it's what is left unscathed, uncontaminated, and free in this troubled world of ours. I invite all those who have felt the call of poetry to heed that call and delve into its wonderful universe as readers or incipient writers. And I urge full-fledged poets to continue to enrich the world poetic legacy in any and all languages, as beautifully demonstrated by the Provost 
mingled voices and poetries, which the, po the poets we've heard this evening have done. And we hope they will continue to do. And those of you who haven't done so yet, we hope to hear your poems in due course. Now, questions. Anybody would like to ask a question or make a comment of any poet present? Or um, if people are thinking, I will ask a question because it's very, very easy, but I'm going to ask Liam a question. So Liam has a very interesting uh, discipline in that, well, you will explain it yourself. So Liam has invented his own form and he keeps very strictly within that form. And I'd like Liam to tell us why he chose that form and why he finds it so very useful. Thank you very much for asking the question. Um, the poem that I've read tonight, uh, and uh, all the poems I write, uh, follow a special form. The poem has uh, six stanzas. Each of the stanzas has six lines, and each line has six syllables. Um, for about four years now, I've only written poems in this form. I think at this point I've written maybe about 150 <laughs> poems in this form. Um, I think the, the form is... Uh, uh, very useful to me for some reason. Uh, I think, of course, poetry works well when you set yourself limits. Um, but then for me, uh, the form has now become a bit of an obsession. And uh, I mean, the thing that's interesting about it is that because it's a set form, you can um, make all these patterns and repetitions within the poem. And um, I try to keep it sounding like natural language, but actually when you see it on a page, you see that the form is quite strict. Um, so this is, this is my technique. Um, and uh, I've shared it with others as well, and other people have written poems in the form as well. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Can I just ask, follow up from that? Um, the people who copied you, um, copied your form, um, could you give some comments about the contents? Is it a similar contents to your theme? Well, uh, uh, I, I won't name him, but uh, uh, a, uh, someone I know recently did a, a poem of, in his own style in the form, and not only did he follow the 666 um, uh, structure, but also he wrote it in iambic pentameter, <laughs> which is very impressive, but, and I don't do that, but I think what is unique about the way that I write it is that because of the form uh, has a very numerical structure, you can repeat motifs and you can repeat images in a way which is uh, which is, is kind of aesthetically interesting. It can be like an echo in the poem, um, and no one who has copied the form has uh, has done it quite like I like to do it. <laughs> um, but uh, but other people have wrote, written very nice poems as well. Yeah, thank, thank, you, you. thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Now, somebody else asked a question. I I can keep on asking questions, but I, I'd like somebody somebody else to. Anybody? Did I hear a little voice somewhere? Yeah. Um, perhaps I could ask Louisa then. Could you perhaps explain the background to your poem? Because you, you've put two, two cultural contexts together. Louisa, yes. Oh, it, oh, the poem that sorry. you read, yes. I, the poem I read tonight? Yeah. Uh, do you mean, sorry, that there are two, two... If you could just give the background to that. Oh, uh, OK. Well... <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I have always been obsessed by music and played by uh, all the lute, especially the Renaissance, Italian Renaissance lute. I used to know many, many songs. I mean, especially in my um, childhood and, uh, and teenage, I used to sing a lot those songs. And yeah, I don't know, it just came to me, I don't know, like a vision. <laughs> it's very difficult to explain, but yes, uh, the, the words that are um, uh, said by the, 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 the courtesan says, actually those words that, you know, some people are, uh, most people are in need of society, but only a few um, society needs, actually those words are quoted by, um, I read uh, diaries written by real uh, 
geiko, I mean geishas, let's call them like that. And yes, I mean, uh, this kind of sentence really, you know, uh, troubled me because it's, uh, it's pretty terrible to think about it. But in the real fact, uh, yes, I mean, it is a little bit like that. And uh, I tried to apply that uh, reasoning to the rest of the life considerations that you find in the poem. So about all those people who die and they in battles that they don't really understand very well because they they are probably illiterate, you know, and they don't exactly know why they they go to battle and then they are swallowed into into rapid forgetfulness. We only remember all these people who brought glory to uh, the castles in, in, you know, like Renaissance time. In Italy, there were a lot of uh, small states and they were very often at war with each other and many people died for, uh, you know, making them uh, glorious and, uh, and that's about, uh, you know, um, meditation on this, <laughs> I mean, so yeah, um, but really uh, I think about the lute player and the songs, uh, and the song player on the lute, cantore al liuto, that is the Italian word for that, it's just that uh, I, after so many years, I'm still obsessed by that music, I just like it so much and I listen to it all the time and I sing sometimes also, you know, so <laughs> I think uh, it came to me like a vision. Yeah. Thank you very much, Louisa. Thank you so yeah. much. Does anybody else, would anybody else like to ask a question of anybody? Um, in that case, everybody has a lot more to say and we'd like to hear more from everybody, but the time is moving on. So I'd very much like to thank all of you for coming. Thank you very much to the poets who read, your answers to questions. Thank you very much to the audience. We hope you will take a look at the books at the back. Some are free or a donation of $20, and the others are the books of the evening. So we have Mingle Voices 3, which is on the table where you may give a donation or take it for nothing. And Mingle Voices 5, which is the newest version, is on the other table and is an honesty box. The price is $98. There are $2 coins, so if you put $100 in, you're free to take $2 out. But please monitor it yourself. And I hope you will take some because I have to carry them away this evening. And I, I can't actually manage to carry all of them. So thank you very much, and please take a look at the book. And thank you very much to Karis for being so very helpful and steering us through quite smoothly. Thank you very much.